So, um, you know, uh, I was preparing for service today and I had a message all written out, all planned, you know, something that I had preached before and, you know, had it real good in my heart. And then the Lord just kind of switched gears on me. He said, I want you to just preach a simple message on the gospel. I said, well, praise God. I said, well, praise God. So we're going to preach a simple message today on the gospel. Amen. Amen. Now, listen, uh, I know I'm not Pastor Aaron, um, but I will just tell you that I like some response when I'm ministering. Uh, because I have the attitude that if you don't amen me, you don't encourage me, I can encourage myself. Amen. I don't want to do that, but I will if I have to. So we're going to preach the gospel today. Um, and we know that the gospel, right, one definition of the gospel is the first four books of the New Testament church. Amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Is that right? Good. Y'all responding real good. Thank you for that. But these gospels, they give an account of Jesus' life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, and they proclaim the good news of God's victory over the powers of sin and death. Amen. And it is a message of salvation, justification, and sanctification. That's good news. Wouldn't you agree? And also, we know that the gospel is the foundation of the New Testament church. And uh, if you don't know, I'll just let you know that you are living in a New Testament church. And scripture says that this New Testament or this new covenant is one that's far better. In other words, God would not have made a New Testament is the old, if the old was good enough. Now, I'm not making light of the Old Testament. You need to have a good understanding and a revelation of what the Old Testament is because it's a prophetic picture of what is to come in the new. Amen. Amen. But the gospel is the foundation of this New Testament church. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Uh, and we're going to start reading here in verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Uh, and he said to them, but who do you say I am? Let me just pause right there for a minute. It's good to know what other people say about Jesus. Wouldn't you agree? But it's far better to know what you say about Jesus. And he's asking them, yeah, that's good that they say that, but I want to know what you say. Amen. And then Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. That word Peter in the Greek is the word Petros, and it means a large piece of rock. You are Peter, or you are this large piece of rock, or that revelation that God gave you of who I am is a rock that you can stand on. And on this rock, that word is the Greek word Petra, and it means a huge rock, as in the rock of Gibraltar. He says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Amen. So just let me inform you that when he says, I will build my church, he's not talking about the facilities that we have at 6101 Masonic Drive or at 624 Main Street in Pineville. He's talking about the church, the people of God, that's you and I. He says he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So for you and I, what that means is no matter what comes, hell or high water, the church will prevail. No matter what the devil devil tries to throw you away. I said the church will prevail. You will overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter whether the economy is down or whether the economy is up or whether it's in between. God said he is building his church and the church, it will prevail. It will prevail. Say I am the church of the living God. And the gates of hell shall not overcome me. I am the church, and I 
will prevail in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right, y'all can get me started if you want to. The Apostle Paul states that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, now let me remind you, since it seems to have escaped you. How many of you know that it's, it's, it's certain times in life it's okay to be reminded of things? Uh, because I believe that there's no one who is intelligent enough to remember everything that he knows. So he says, and now let me remind you since it seems to have escaped you. In other words, you may, have be, you may be facing a situation where you're looking at the situation and you think that the situation is bigger than God, but he says, let me remind you just in case it has escaped you. Brethren, the gospel, the glad tidings of salvation, which I proclaim to you, which you welcome and accept it upon with your faith rests, and by which you are saved if you hold fast and keep firm Firmly what I preach to you. Come on. Unless you believed at first without effect and all for nothing. In other words, unless you was just putting on a show. For I pass on to you, first of all, what I also have received. In other words, Brother Greg is standing here preaching to you the word, but I can't give you anything that God hadn't given me. That Christ, who is he? He's the Messiah, the anointed one. And what did he do? He died for our sins in according to what the scriptures told us or foretold. And he was buried that he rose on the third day as the scriptures foretold. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of this New Testament church. And it's on what we build a life in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And of course, the gospel is good news. And my purpose today is to deliver and announce to you that there is good news. I don't know what your week has been like. I don't even know what your Sunday morning has been like. But my purpose today, my assignment today is to announce that there is good news. That no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you've been through, that God is still on the throne that his promises to you and I are yes and amen. amen. That you are more than a conqueror through Christ who gives you the strength. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm here to announce to you a message of victory. You are not defeated. I don't care what life has thrown your way. When you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, you become victorious. You are triumphant in every area of life. There is no defeat before you. The devil is a defeated foe and your foot is on his neck. You are a child of the Most High God and the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you and you can do all that God says you can do. You can be who God says you can be and you can go where God says you can go. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, you might ask this question. What makes the gospel good news? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked, church. The gospel is good news because it gives the solution to the troubles of this world. It establishes the kingdom of God here on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The gospel offers forgiveness through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news because we have been given a new life in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone, is there any ones in the room today? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And what does that mean for you? Your old way of thinking is gone. Come on, you're not thinking of a less than kind of person. You're thinking of a more than kind of person because you realize that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. Your old way of thinking is done away with and you have a complete reformation in the way that you think. And when you think about who you are in Christ Jesus, it draws all of the blessings of God into your life. Amen. I'm just getting started. When you get the revelation of who you are in Christ, you, you are given a new heart and a new nature. 
old principles and old practices are passed away. And all these things have become new. And you are now a child of God, able to live the life that God had planned for you all along. You know what that life is called? It's the Zoe. Zoe, the God kind of life. Or the life that God has intended for believers. Of course, we know that in the Old Testament, Adam sold out, gave way to the devil. But God says he has a plan for that. He gave us Jesus, and now through Christ, we're able to live the life that God originally meant for us to live, that we have dominion over everything. I said we have dominion over everything. If you can name it, that means we have dominion over it. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, you are of God, little children. Now, I know that some people think he's talking about the little children like the I-54 or the uh, Kitty Cove Nursery. No, but he's talking about children of God. Amen. Amen. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who is them? Those are the ones that are in the world. Those are the ones that try to trip you up. Those are the ones that try to throw salt or shade or try to spill the tea about you and your relationship with God or what you have going on. Because he who is in you. It's greater than he is who, in the, who is in the world. Come on. The world don't have anything to offer you. You got everything to offer the world. The spirit of God lives on the inside of you. The word of God is in your mouth and in your heart. You have everything to offer the world. Pastor B.B. Hankins says it like this. I'd rather be in the church on his worst day than in the world on his best day. Why is that? Because the world don't have anything to offer me. Everything I need is found in Christ. I said everything I need is found in Christ. Hallelujah. If you're taking notes, write this down. The gospel is good news because we have been raised together with Christ. I said we've been raised together with Christ. We've been raised together with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, this is the Amplified. I'll give it to you in a couple of translations. He said, and he raised us up together with him when we believed. That's important. And he seated us with him in heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. The Amplified Classic renders it just a little different. And it says, he raised us up together with him and made us us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him. Whoo, praise God. And the heavenly spear, by virtue of being in Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So what you see here, yes, we were raised up together with Christ, but when Christ finished his work, we sat down together with him. And we have joint seating with him. So what does that mean to you and I as this New Testament church, as this New Testament believers? That means, oh man, that we can just sit down right in the presence of our enemies. Come on, because we know what side of the boat we're on. We're on the boat and we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. The things that this world has to offer us, they tend to grow strangely dim when you have a revelation of where you're seated. I said they tend to grow strangely dim when you have a revelation of where you're seated. I'll just submit this to you. If you ever find yourself in a situation and you feel like you're on a level playing field with the devil, you ain't ready yet. You need to come up to where you're seated. And when you come up to where you're seated, you will get the understanding that the devil is already defeated. And all you have to do is speak the word of God out of your mouth because the word of God in your mouth is just as powerful as the word of God in his mouth. Amen. Are y'all doing all right this morning? In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, it says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I'll now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, when Christ died, I died. The old me died. In other words, I'm united in the death of Christ by faith. I know you weren't there physically, but you were there spiritually. Ooh, glory to God. So we have literally died the old life and we are risen to a new life in Christ Jesus. Pastor Mark says it like this. You look a whole lot better in Christ than you do out of Christ. Amen. I mean, how many of you have that testimony? Yeah, I know I'm sitting, I'm standing up here preaching the word, but brother Greg ain't always lived this life in Christ. 
But when I look back on my life, I look a whole lot better now than I did then. Yes. Amen. And see, this is the deception of the devil for the people in the world. He'll have you believing that you're really enjoying life. I was there thinking that I was really enjoying life, wasting my money on partying and drinking and running around and doing all this stuff. And the Lord said, look here, son, if you really want to enjoy life, get back to your first love. I've always been a child of God. I grew up in church my whole life, graduated school, left home and acted a fool for 10 years. <laughs> but God said, no, 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 no. Get back to your first love. Get back to your first love. And he simply arrested me. And when he arrested me, I surrendered. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 in the Amplified Classic, it says it like this. I have been crucified with Christ. In him, I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, the Messiah, lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith by adherence to and reliance on in complete trust in the Son of God. All right, so y'all ain't, ain't meeting on that too good, so let me just expound a little bit. In other words, what he's saying is you don't have to depend on your natural faculties. You don't have to depend on your intellect. You don't, depend, you don't have to depend on how much money you do have or you don't have or what side of the track you were raised on. No, you don't depend on that. Your dependence is on Christ and what he did for you in his death, burial, and resurrection. He paid the price for you to walk in the liberty and freedom to be a child of God. Okay, if you're taking notes, write this down. Uh, I said that and I remind, I'm reminded of Miles Monroe. He used to always say that when he had a good point. He said, write this down. If you don't know who he is, you need to look him up. But the gospel is good news because we are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, it says, For we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Certainly we also shall, be, also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. No longer slaves to sin. Now, I understand that most people, when you talk about being a slave to sin, what they think about is actually, you know, like, committing sin, going out and do some, doing something that is against the will of God. Sin literally means missing the mark. And that's true. But how many of you know if you can still be a slave to sin and still be held in bondage, if you are a Christian, but all you do every day when you get up is try not to sin? That's not the life that God has created for you and I to live. No, if you're a child of God, you receive the grace and mercy that God offers to you, and you don't have to even be concerned about sin because it no longer enters your mind, it no longer enters your desires, and you can walk in freedom and liberty of what the blood of Jesus has done for you, and we're no longer slaves to sin. Amen. In Romans chapter 5, verses 20 through 21, I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture, but if it's okay to read scripture in church, I, I believe I'm just going to keep on. Yeah. Romans chapter 5, verses 20 through 21. It says, moreover, the law entered the, uh, that the offense might abound, but... Whenever there's a but in scripture, pay close attention to what comes after it. It says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I want you to get a good picture of what grace is. Yes, we are a New Testament church and we are under grace, but grace is not a ticket to live life foolish, foolishly. Grace is not a ticket to say, well, you know, I can do whatever I want. And because God is so loving and so graceful and so merciful, I can come back to him. That is true. But that's not why God gives us grace. God gives us grace to compel us into the middle of his will for our life. God gives us grace so that we may go out and be an example to the world of how a real believer, a true Christian, one that is Christ like lives their life. We're not here playing church. We are the church. 
I mean, Jesus is no longer on the earth in his physical body, but he's inside of you and me. And when you go, wherever you go, you're carrying him with you. Amen. Praise God. We're no longer slaves to sin. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, this is the Amplified Classic version, and it says, and so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe, is demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead, the very same power that caused Christ to rise from the dead is alive on the inside of you and I. Hallelujah. And seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, above every title to be conferred, not only in this age, but in this world, but also in this age in the world which is to come. So I'm just telling you, you don't have to be concerned with what's going on in the world. <laughs> you, could, you don't have to be all, I mean, I understand, you know, you know, what's, you know, I, I see everything that everybody else sees. I don't watch the news. I don't read the newspapers, but I hear and I see everything else that's going on, not only in the world, but if you just took a look at central Louisiana, let's get more specific. If you just took a look at Alexandria, Louisiana, there's a lot of foolishness going on in the world and that may be true, but what's happening in the church I said what's happening in the church is so much more powerful than what's happening in the world. What's happening in the church is so much more powerful. Now remember, I told you earlier that the church ain't the building, but you are the church. So in other words, what's happening in you is much more powerful than what's happening in the world. So when you go out, know that the church is in you. I, can, can I talk to y'all over here for a minute? I said when you go out, know that the church is in you. You are the church of the living God. You are the church of the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to have to speed up because y'all listening slow this morning. I don't know, but I'm having a good time. How about y'all? Write this down. The gospel is good news because we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The gospel is good news because we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I want to give you a working definition of that word redeem. It means to purchase back, to ransom, to liberate or rescue from captivity or bondage or from any obligation or liability to suffer or to be forfeited by paying an equivalent. The equivalent has been paid. Hallelujah. It also means to regain possession of a thing that has been alienated by repaying the value of it to the possessor. I think the blood of Jesus took care of that bill for you and I. It means to rescue, to recover, to deliver, to free by making atonement. It means to pay the penalty. It means to rescue and deliver from bondage, from the bondage of sin and the penalties of God's violated law. That means when you missed it, that's okay because the blood of Jesus has taken care of it. All you have to do is repent, turn away from your sin, confess your sins before God and ask for forgiveness. He's taking care of it by obedience and suffering in the place of the sinner. Who did that for you? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Or by doing and suffering that which is accepted in lieu of your sins. Come on, come on. I'm just saying, Jesus has already did the hard work. You and I, we believe and we receive. I said we believe and we receive that what he did in the death, burial, and resurrection was enough. I said what he did in the death, burial, and resurrection was enough. When I find myself in my feelings, I realize that they're just feelings. I realize that they're just feelings, but sometimes feelings can feel so real that they cause us to get a little discombobulated and, and forget what God has said in his word. Just because you feel a certain way, just because you may be a little downtrodden, don't change the word of God. I said, he's still on the throne. Man is not God. God is man. God is God. So we keep our reliance. We keep our dependence. We keep our faith in line with who God is and who we are in God or in Christ. 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 and 14, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Somebody say, I've been redeemed. I've been set free. I've been given a clean slate. I, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us, for it is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Just so you know, I believe that probably the majority of us in this room, we're Gentiles, so, should, so we should be walking in the blessings of Abraham. And if you don't know the blessings of Abraham, I encourage you to look it up, just so you can get an understanding of what God's saying you ought to be walking in. If I had time, I would go into that. But again, y'all listening, you listening slow. <laughs> that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Through faith. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, it says, The Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. We have been redeemed. God knew that we would have to deal with this flesh and we'd have to deal with the world and then you know, we'd have to deal with our mind, but he put his spirit in us that we might be able to rely on him, not from the outside, but from the inside. Well, I'm about to close, y'all. <laughs> I don't know. You know, Pastor Aaron usually takes two or three closings. I'm just going to get one. <laughs> if you're taking notes, write this down. The gospel is good news because it reveals Jesus is king. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 13, it says, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. It, his name is called the word of God. Revelations 19, 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So when you see Jesus, he's not just a king, but he's the king. And he's my king. Now, the best description that I've ever heard of Jesus as king was by the Reverend Dr. S.M. Lockridge. And so I just want to share this with you. I'm just going to read it to you, and I hope it's an encouragement to you and a blessing to you. So just give me your attention for just a few minutes here. It says, the Bible says, my king is a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews, that's a racial king. He's the king of Israel, that's a national king. He's the king of righteousness, he's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven, he's the king of glory. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. Well, church, I wonder, do you know him? David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the wonder, and, and the firmament shows his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He's endearingly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally grateful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet, church. He's the greatest phenomenon that ever crossed the horizons of the world. He's God's son. He's the center savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. He's august. He's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's the 
loftiest ideal in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the cardinal necessity of spiritual religion. He's the miracle of the ages. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. Church, I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustain. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives the sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligence. He beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him today, church. I wonder if you know him today, church. Well, he's my king. And he is the king. He's the key of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway to righteousness. He's a highway to holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his office is manifold. His promise is sure. His light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable. He's uncomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him but they find out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him and the witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree about him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah, that's my king. I said, that's my king. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the glory and thine is the power. That's my king. That's my king. That's my king. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's my king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he's not just my king for today, but he's my king forever and ever. And ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever, he's an eternal king. <laughs> I have in my notes to ask the worship team to come up, but they beat me to the punch on this one. Somebody say, he's my king. He's my king. That's a personal king. Because you may, him, may have witnessed him being your grandmama's king, the pastor's king, but until you know him, he's your king. That's what makes all the difference. I have one more scripture that I'm going to share with you. The gospel is good news because you can sit down. The gospel is good news because it offers salvation to the sinner. The gospel is good news, write it down, because it offers salvation to the sinner. Romans chapter 10 and verse eight, it says, but what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is a word of faith, which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made. Confession is made. John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that those who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. <laughs> 